Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we have paintings 7 through 10 in my 60 and 30 challenge. And these, some of these are a little bit different. So this first one, I felt like I was just taking so long on it. In fact, I think the other three in this video I did and the amount of time it took me to do this one. And I just felt like I was spending so much time on all of these and that was going to make it really challenging to get through this challenge. So uh, I went ahead and continued with this one the way I was, you know, the way I had been doing all of the other ones and just enjoyed it. But after this one, I uh, challenged myself to work on them a little bit quicker. I think my main thing, my main inspiration with this one was just using a couple of colors that seem very unlikely. You know, that hot pink, it's actually called opera pink. It was, you know, not really a color you think of for, you know, sky or air or whatever. And so I definitely <laughs> went for it and threw it in the sky and I feel like it works. Something about it makes me feel like winter. So this almost feels like a winter scene for me, even though there's not any snow in the painting. But I felt like the opera pink with this um, paraline green was a really uh, unique, we'll say unique, color combination. And it was really fun. And that's one of the things that I love so much about watercolor is it's it's almost like a challenge to mix the weirdest colors you can think of together and see what you come up with. Especially with really nice watercolors like the Daniel Smith watercolors that I use. They're very nice watercolors. They use a lot of natural pigments and so as you can tell the blue, it, it kind of, uh, it's called granulating. It kind of looks gritty or sandy the way it separates. And there's a bit of that in the green as well. So where the green and the pink meet, there's this really unique separation. And we've got that same separation in the blue and the pink. And I think things like that are really fun to play with. And it's one of the main reasons that I love using watercolor for things like this because not only does watercolor move on its own and you know it's really pretty and all of that but there's there's this element of surprise that happens where you don't really know how a paint is going to look when it dries even colors that i know that do quite a bit of that granulation on their own you know, under certain cir circumstances or when they're mixed with certain other colors, they may granulate less or more. If you mix two colors, one that doesn't granulate with one that granulates, you get some really interesting effects that are so much fun to sit and watch. And, you know, it's almost like little mini science experiments. <laughs> so if you're not you know, a sciencey minded nerd like me, maybe, maybe that's not exciting for you. But those kind of things are pretty exciting for me. I put that yellow in there thinking I was going to try and get like a little bright point and then I didn't like it. So I just covered it up with the tree. I wasn't really sure what was going on with that hole in the first place. I didn't know what to do with it. So now it's part of a tree and gouache yes guys this is gouache it's white it's white gouache which is essentially opaque watercolor so every single painting when i use that i get a million questions what is that what is that it's gouache and remember in the video description i list out all of the materials that i use um, including the brands so I'm getting a lot of questions about the paper that I use too. This is just really inexpensive Canson watercolor paper. I like the block because then I don't have to tape it down. It doesn't curl. This is not fancy paper. 
It's not hard to find. It's not expensive. It's not special. I mean, I like it. I'm not saying it's no offense to Canson, and I'm not saying that it's not special. Like, you know, I like it. I buy tons of it. But my, my point is, if you're going to try this, just grab some watercolor paper. It doesn't matter what brand it is. It doesn't matter if it's cotton or cellulose or if it's expensive or if it's cheap. It kind of matters if it's like super cheap. Don't buy super cheap watercolor paper because you get what you pay for. Um, but yeah, I like the Canson. It's super affordable, but for the price, it's really good. Uh, but don't worry so much about what exactly I'm painting on. My only real thing with watercolor paper is um, 140 pound. You don't want 90 pound because it's going to curl a lot. 140 pound at least. They make higher, like 300 pound. But um, yeah, so I'm using 140 pound. I use cold press, which has the texture. Hot press is very smooth that can be really hard for beginners to use. It can be really frustrating to use super smooth paper like hot press. So cold press, 140 pound. You find paper that says that, you're golden. Do it. So this painting, I decided I was going to take a step back and simplify things just a little bit more. Here you'll see a bit of what I was talking about with the different granulations. Of the paints so that Prussian blue that I'm using it doesn't granulate a whole lot as you can see in that large dark area but I'm adding some Payne's gray and the Payne's gray does granulate a bit and you can see that as the Payne's gray settles for a minute it starts to look grainy and I think that's really fun I like to buy colors that uh, are quite granulating because they're super fun to play with. They give really interesting um, textures and looks. They mix with other paints in completely unexpected ways. They're a lot of fun. Wanted to kind of convey like a, a rainstorm over, you know, like some grassy plains. I'm about to make a tree in this painting and it's one of my favorite ways to make trees in watercolor and you know soon when we do our absolute beginner watercolor lesson I will show you how to make super quick super easy trees so you're gonna see me doing that here in just a second I love how there's no real separation between the sky and the ground here. It just feels very, you know, abstract and dreamy. Here's my little tree. See that? All I did was just wipe a damp, very slightly damp, not wet, not drippy. I just wiped a very slightly damp brush up there and then poked into it with some paint and you know, the, the water does the rest. So far, I'm really enjoying this challenge. Uh, let's see, 10. So I've got 50 left to do. I've already noticed that it's changing the way that I approach watercolor, you know, doing so many of them and trying to do them as quickly as possible. It's kind of changing the way that I approach it, the way that I think about it. And that's really exactly what I was going for. I want to have, you know, kind of that uh, maturity to my process, if that makes any kind of sense. I feel like when you know exactly what to do to get your desired look and you are also open at the same time to surprises happening and you know other unexpected things happening I feel like you get a little bit of a maturity to your work and so that's kind of what I was looking for to happen here 
This is another one where I'm just trying to go nice and quick. Kind of another one of these uh, stormy skies over some plains. I really like these, you know, abstract kind of vast uh, landscapes where it looks like you're looking out over, you know, a, a very large area and kind of taking it all in, almost panoramic style. So that's what's going on in here. And in that sky, I'm using one of my favorite colors. Again, it is by Daniel Smith. It's called Moon Glow. And it's such a unique color. You can kind of see it happening here already, but as it, as it settles, it separates, and you start to see really interesting colors coming out of it. There you can kind of see some pink and purple. As I drop that water in there, you can start to see some blue. It's a really, it's a really fun color to use. And I thought it made a really nice, kind of bruised looking stormy sky. So this one's pretty quick. So I know a lot of you have expressed that you're excited to learn more about watercolor. So tell me what kind of things you'd like to learn about it. What things have you seen me do that, you know, is something that you'd be interested in? Or what kind of techniques have you heard about or seen about or have tried and struggled with? Tell me what kind of things you would like to learn about with regards to watercolor so that when I make my beginner's watercolor video soon, uh, I can make sure to hit all of those, all of those topics for you. For all of you guys who have been asking about gouache, the next uh, painting is for you. It is one that I intentionally went out with the idea of using a lot of gouache in it to kind of give you an idea of how that works with watercolor. Just making a couple little trees on the horizon there. Those uh, ground colors bled up into the sky and rather than fighting it and trying to wipe it away, I decided, all right, now there are bushes and trees. So, you know, I think when you paint like this, you have to be open to things happening and you have to be willing to say, oh, that's what happened. Great, we're gonna go with it. Because if you go into this and, you know, something like that happens, you get a wash up into the sky, you can try and wipe it away, but it's gonna leave a little cast of that color and you can probably end up overworking the paint, tearing up the paper if you work at it even more. It's just easier and better if you just go with it. And as you use the medium and as you learn more about the medium, you can start to control those things, you know, so that on your next painting, you don't get a backwash up into the sky like that if that's not what you want. Or maybe you saw exactly how that happened and in your next painting you want to do that on purpose and now you know what it takes to do that. So that's one of the, I guess that's just an example of, you know, quote unquote, m making mistakes. So that could be considered a mistake because I didn't intend to do it. But if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't know how to prevent that from happening or how to make it happen on purpose. So, I mean, it's only, it's only a mistake and it's only a bad thing if you fight against it and, and, you know, yeah, just fighting against it. That's what makes it a bad thing. If you go with it and work with it, then it can be a really good and positive learning experience. 
I let that dry completely and then I'm just using some gouache and scratching in some little sticky bits in there to make it look like maybe some distant bushes or something. And on to the last one. And again, this is my favorite one. I don't know if it's, you know, just that the last one is always my favorite. It's definitely that the, the black and white ones or the gray ones are always my favorite because that's how I roll. But I was really playing with, I have a lot of different uh, grays and blacks in watercolor. And you might think, well, how many do you need? They all <laughs> granulate differently and have various degrees of transparency. So I like to use a lot of different ones because I get some really interesting texture. This one is br uh, black tourmaline. And as you can see, it's granulating quite a bit. See how gritty that looks. And I'm gonna come in with a couple different ones and get different uh, warmths and different kind of granulation, different textures and so that's why I hit this with like four different colors of gray black. This is another one of my favorites. It's hematite. As you can see, it's a little bit browner. The granulation on this one is a little bit softer too. So it's pretty interesting. I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted it to be black and white and I was going to put a lot of gouache on it. That was all I knew. That's Payne's Gray. It's quite a bit cooler, a little bluer. And again, the granulation is a little bit softer. This one, I let dry a lot. I went back and forth with this one all day while I was painting the other ones. So, you know, I do a bit and then set it aside to dry it. Now it's dry, just some gouache. You'll notice it'll all of a sudden look like the gouache is gone. And that's because it looks pure white, but it's very transparent when it dries. And see, it looks like it's gone now. It takes a lot of layers of gouache to build up to really cover something. So I think it's kind of fun to challenge yourself. How white can you make it? <laughs> I'll put gouache on there as thick and as heavy as I feel like I can. And then when it dries, you know, it goes transparent and I do another layer and it might be frustrating for some people, but for me, I think it's kind of fun. So I was starting to get just a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a mood here that I wanted to go with, but I'm still just kind of playing around and finding what that composition might be. It started feeling like a very old grainy black and white photo, like if you watch um, movies, old uh, silent movies by like F.W. Murnau, uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is a good one, Nosferatu is an excellent one. I really love old silent films and this kind of has that feeling to me, those old silent film horror movies from the from the 30s. more gouache. See how I'm building that up and every time it dries it, it is just a little less transparent than it was before but I wiped actually quite a bit of it off of the top. I decided I wanted it brighter toward the horizon. Give it more of a tonalism feel. Nice and bright at the horizon and kind of blurry and then you know a little darker up toward the top. I'm trying to keep all those lines super soft too so it just feels like everything is glowing a bit. I was really excited that I was able to get four paintings done on this day and I'm hoping that I can keep that up because what I really don't want is to get to the end of the month and be like, oh look, we're going to challenge ourselves to do paintings in two brush strokes <laughs> simply because I'm so far behind and trying to get them, trying to get them done as quickly as possible.
As always, you guys, I'm so grateful that you come to watch my videos and hang out with me. And it really means a lot to me. And, you know, that a lot of you have been sharing how you've been feeling during this time. And it has, you know, helped me to understand that I am, I'm not alone. It's not just me who's feeling artistically broken a lot of times. And so that helps me feel like I'm in good company. And, you know, we can, we can get through this together and we can all get back into, you know, the swing of making art and, and hanging out together. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. When in doubt, splatter the paint. Splattering paint is good for your soul. I promise. Even for you tidy people who, you know, are like, oh, I don't want to splatter paint. I don't want to make a mess. I'm going to mess up my painting or my carpet or my clothes or whatever. I mean, I guess I understand that, but splattering paint is more important to me than <laughs> not having paint on everything I own. All right, guys, there you go. There's all four of them. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and watching. Remember to... Leave me a comment below and let me know how you've been challenging yourself. And I will see you next time.